screen live when you see then you start mm. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. So today I am welcome you in another session of biology series. So today's topic is clinical trial execution and what are what are the uh, difficulties we face while uh, doing a clinical trial. So today's speaker is Dr. Monica Vinish. She is a clinical trial professional in a CRO responsible for and monitoring the clinical research staff. She's done her PhD from PGM MER, so she is our alumni and. Uh, she has the uh, she has a multidisciplinary background in neurology, neuropharmacology, and dermatology. She has uh, more than ten years of experience in preclinical and clinical research studies. Today we will be also joined by our uh, commentator for the session, Dr. Bikas Medhi. Uh, he is professor and ex additional medical superintendent in PGMER. He is coordinator of PGMER Pharmacovigilance Center and Material Vigilance Center. Regional Resource and Training and Technical Support Center for North India. He is Regional Coordinator of NADA for North Zone, Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports, Government of India. He is also Chief Editor of Indian Journal of Pharmacology. His area of expertise include experimental pharmacology, clinical research, regulatory pharmacology, pharmacogenetics, pharmacogenomics, development of nanoformulation and stem cells, and but it is not limited to these. And I welcome you both for this session. Thank you for joining us. Uh, over to Don, uh, Dr. Monica, please, uh, you can start with your speech. Okay. Thank you, Manjari, for the nice introduction. <clears throat> can you able to see my slides? Yes. So if I'm looking in this direction, I have slides on the bigger screen and then I have my camera here. So that's why I'm looking there. So um, I have <clears throat> two computer. Um, so good morning, everyone who are joining from the North America and good evening who, has, who is joining this session from India. Um, so I'm, it's my pleasure to be talking to you all in my neurology research lab. Um, and on, on the clinical trial execution and its challenges. Um, so I am Monica Vinish. Um, so let me start with the, I mean, um, my introduction. Give me one moment. I didn't do the slideshow. Just give me one moment. Okay. So I'll start with the introduction part. I know Manjri has already introduced me, uh, but few years back, I was, um, I completed my PhD in neuroscience from PGI Chandigarh. Uh, I came to United States for the postdoctoral experience in neuropharmacology. Uh, I have also um, uh, did uh, uh, my research in the wound healing area. And uh, currently I'm working at the contract research organization, which is also known as CRO. It's a global CRO. And we have an office in India as well, and also in some in Europe, and as well as in United States, we have an office in Miami. Um, so that's where I'm, um, you know, uh, learning the experience in the clinical trial management and now uh, clinical monitor. Moving on um, to the to the to the topic. So, what are the clinical trials? So these are the research studies that explore whether the medical strategy treatment devices is safe and effective for humans. And um, it takes, I mean, on the average, it takes 12 years uh, for an experimental drug from tra from, to travel from lab to the medicine chest. And this is an extremely expensive uh, process, clinical trial. Uh, it takes billions of dollars um, to, you, you know, to get one drug to the market. And um, as I mentioned that, um, the, it takes many, many years and only five in 5,000 compounds that enter the clinical testing make it to the human testing. And one out of those five tested um, will get finally approved. So, um, I mean, why, I mean, a lot of people, they have this question in mind that why clinical trials are important. So why? Because the clinical trials, they, um, they look at the new ways to prevent, detect, and treat diseases. And the treatment, the, the, there might be the new drugs or new combination of drugs or new surgical procedures or devices or new ways to the existing treatment. 
And uh, the goal of clinical trial is to determine if the new treatment or um, work or and it is safe and more effective. So, um, so there is, um, I mean, if you go look into the history of clinical trials, so, so they have been, um, there is a lot of history in the clinical trials that where people, they started um, doing some interventions in the surgical procedures. But um, in the history, what I found is the proper clinical trial that was first ever conducted by um, James Lind uh, in 1753. Um, that, um, you know, he treated um, um, his sailor, a group of subjects, a small group of subjects. He had six, uh, six groups where two people, two participants in each subject, and he treated them with, uh, you know, um, substance ranging from vinegar to cedar. And uh, he found out that the groups who were given oranges and lemon, they largely recovered from the scurvy. Scurvy is a disease of vitamin C deficiency. Um, so then we also have a bad examples of clinical trials in the history. Um, so you know, like the, the Tuskegee syphilis study where um, more than 400 black men and syf with syphilis and 200 men without syphilis recruited without informed consent. And then they were misinformed that some of the procedures uh, were actually the free treatment. And then we have example of another study which is uh, Cincinnati radiation experiments um, that was conducted in 1960s, where the cancer patients, um, mostly minority, which is Blacks, um, were, um, they were exposed to large doses of whole body radiation as a part of experiments sponsored by the US military. And um, none of these subjects given the informed consent. And um, the, because of this high radiation, the subject experienced nausea, vomiting, and acute radiation, radiation sickness and some of them, they die. Um, so um, after that, um, you know, it, it, it was happening in early 90s and, um, you know, then un until um, FDA uh, regulation for the conduct of clinical trial has been, um, you know, passed in 1970s and that took care of the clinical trials and human subject protection and adherence to um, FDA regulation, the principle of good clinical practice including human subject protect, uh, protection is recognized. Now it is uh, recognized as a critical requirement to the ethical conduct of the clinical research, um, which involved the human subjects. Um, and I wanted to uh, just make a disclaimer um, that all the information that I'm sharing here is I what I have learned and um, you know understand based on my experience in the United States. So every information, all the information that I'm sharing here is based on my understanding and the regula regulations in the United States. Uh, most of the information is same, but there are some regulatory information that is different in the different countries. So. Um, uh, so types of clinical trial. So there are different types of clinical trial. Uh, for example, there are treatment trials uh, that test new treatments, combination of drugs, surgical procedures, and radiation therapies. And there are prevention trials, for example, for the in the COVID-19 cases, um, that there are a lot of trials going, going on to find um, different ways to prevent disease. Um, and the vaccination, include this include the medicine, vaccination, or any lifestyle change. There are screening trials where they, the trials are conducted to find the best way to detect specific disease or health condition. Uh, there are diagnostic trials um, to uh, come up with a better test and procedure. There are quality of life trials to explore ways to improve the comfort and uh, the quality of life of people with any chronic illnesses. So um, how does a drug get approved? Um, so this slide, this is a one slide, but you can, um, I mean, I can easily, if I have to present just this slide and uh, explain each and every phase, it can be a separate 30 to 40 minute talk because each phase has a tremendous amount of information. So, um, but because uh, the sake of the time and then the, just to be within the limits of this topic, uh, the focus is where the focus is the challenges of the clinical trial execution. I would, I would try to you know, explain this slide. Uh, so the, uh, the clinical trial um, start um, with um, 
preclinical stage. So preclinical studies, it's it is um, this is a stage where um, you know the clinical studies, they are preclinical studies where it, the studies research is conducted for many many years um, to prove that that particular compound um, does not produce any negative effect, and um, it is first thoroughly tested in either animals. Uh, like mice, rat, um, or big animals like pigs and monkeys, and then also on the cell lines. And uh, the purpose of these um, studies is to just prove that the drug is not carcinogenic, which means it does not cause any kind of cancer, or it's not mutagenic, um, it does not cause any um, you know, mutation in the body, and to understand how the drug is absorbed how the drug is excreted, how our body react, uh, how the animal body react to the drug. So once the pharmaceutical company, um, so this uh, preclinical research, either it is conducted in the academic research institutes or it is conducted in the pharmaceutical company. So once they prove that the compound appeared to be safe and possibly um, effective in animals, then the company, um, they provide this information. They compile the report uh, in the form of IND, which is called Investigational New Drug Application. And they provide all this information um, to the FDA. They submit to the FDA. And then, um, so IND in the IND, it shows enough research that has been conducted um, to indicate that the specific drug has a potential um, to benefits in human. And then it is FDA's responsibility to make a decision uh, whether the benefit of the drug outweigh um, the risk. So, um, so once the IND drug is, um, you know, IND, um, after the IND application, if the FDA approve um, it's testing for the human. Then we have the phase one clinical trial. Uh, this is the first one, but also, um, so um, there is another phase between the preclinical and the phase one, uh, which is an option, it's called phase zero. And this is optional exploratory um, trial. Um, this is accordance with the FDA guidance, which was passed in 2006. And uh, it basically provides the information, phase zero provide the information that how the agent behaves in the human subjects as it was expected from the preclinical study. So it's just providing the evidence that, you know, the data that has been provided in the animals, um, they, it shows the same trend in the human being. So it is usually tested in very few uh, number of participants, maybe 10 or maybe less than 10, but five to 10 patients. Um, so, but that is the optional, as I mentioned. So uh, after that, it, if it shows, um, you know, no negative effect, it, the, the study moves to the phase one clinical trial. So the phase one um, clinical trial, it, the, the, it is usually conducted in less than 100 participants. And the main focus of the study is to, um, understand the safety, the safety of that particular compound. And uh, here also the phase one is composed of, um, you know, different phases. It's phase one, it has a phase one A and phase one B, uh, where, um, you know, um, in the, where we test um, the different doses, either the single ascending dose been tested in phase one or uh, A, one A and one B where the multiple doses of that particular compound uh, has been tested. Basically, they uh, to find out that they do not exhibit any um, adverse effect. So in the phase 1A, so it's a single ascending dose, which is tested in the small group of participants, like maybe three. And then in the next set of participants, it will be a little higher dose. And then it will be, it goes until the maximum tolerated dose is, uh, you know, reached. And, um, the and also there is um, intolerable side effect uh, started to show up, so that uh, it that that will decide um, you know the, the single dose and then the one B trial. So the multiple ascending dose studies they investigate the pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics, so which mean how the the drug is absorbed in the study, its viability. And then also how our body physiology and biochemistry react to that um, drug. So at this point, the multiple doses are given to the patient and uh, the blood or any fluid is collected. Um, 
at various time point um, to acquire the information that how drug is processed in the body. So um, after the completion of phase one study, once the safety dose and um, is decided, um, so the, 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 the institute, they will file, they compile a CSR, which is called the clinical study report, um, and they submit it to the FDA for its approval for the phase two study. So once FDA approved that, um, then the study moves to the phase two. So phase two is the bigger, and uh, for phase one, depending on the therapeutic indication. So phase one is usually conducted in the healthy participant. And then it takes um, uh, almost a one year to two year of time. And then it, when it moved to the phase two, which involved 100 to 300 participants. And here, um, so we have already decided the safety points. And, and the phase two is mo mostly focused on the efficacy of that particular compound. And um, so if it is uh, safe and effective, um, so at, the, at that time, after the completion of phase two, um, they will also compile the CSR and then submit to the FDA. So um, the, I was, um, and there is a journal statistics that 70% um, of the studies, they usually pass phase one, um, um, but then, only 20 to 25% of the studies that are conducted phase one, they will move on to the phase two and phase three clinical trials. And uh, phase two usually take one to two years. And if, it, if the study if the, is lucky to move to the phase three, phase three, because it involves thousands uh, of uh, heterogeneous population. Um, so it takes two to three years. Uh, depending on the complexity of the study. Um, sometimes it takes more time, a couple of years, because you have to find the right kind of patient based on the inclusion and exclusion criteria, for example, in the rare diseases and in certain kinds of cancers. Um, so uh, the phase three, um, uh, if the drug is safe and, um, and has enough efficacy, it will move to the phase three. And in this phase, thousands of um, heterogeneous um, you know, patients are tested to ensure that there is no side effects um, that were missed in the phase one and phase two. Um, and also if they are successful and the uh, so sponsor compile all the information um, in the new drug application. So if the, the data that is compiled in all these phases and especially in phase three, it is, um, it is good enough um, with the safety and efficacy point of view. So then the drug is submitted for the FDA approval. So then FDA review uh, to confirm the safety and eff uh, effectiveness, it takes um, from 10 months to two years um, in the United States. And uh, once it is approved, the drug is approved, then the, dr the drug entered the phase four. Um, so which involved even the larger population, sometimes the different demography um, to find out, uh, you know, the phase four studies, they are also called uh, market, um, post-market surveillance study. And um, they are, you know, just to find out the long-term risk in the different kind of population. And I know there is a lot of information, but I hope I just as this slide, um, but in case you, wanted to read more about these phases, there are chapters or on each phase uh, of the clinical trial. So this slide just indicate um, the, the key players in the clinical trial. So the cl in the clinical trial, obviously there is a sponsor or a research institute um, or a, who finance, I, as I mentioned, to, um, for the drug development, it takes billions of dollars. So we do need a sponsor who can sponsor that money. So sponsor uh, provide the financial uh, finances. And then uh, we have an investigator, it's the PI or a doctor uh, who conduct this study and hold sole responsible for the proper con conduct of the study as per GCP guidelines. Then we have participants, we have reg regulatory authorities like in the United States, we have FDA, uh, and then we have an ethics committee, which can be, you know, the central or it can be the institutional. And we have a CRA. So I am CRA, um, and the CRA is the liaison between the sponsor and the, the, the sponsor and the investigator. So they visit to the side 
they train the site, they select site, train site, and then they collect all the information and they make sure that the data has been collected. It is as per the protocol, as per the GCP guidelines, and they are following all the regulatory um, you know, regulations. So um, role of IRB. So IRB is an institutional review board or independent ethics committee. Uh, so it's a committee of physician, nurses, statistician, researchers, and member of community. So they ensure that the clinical trial is ethical. Um, the participants' rights and welfare are protected. The research um, the risks are minimum and worth the, uh, the potential benefit. They ensure that SAEs, which are serious adverse events, IND safety reports, uh, protocol non-compliance are submitted on time. Uh, they ensure that the documentation exists of all the submission and approval received from IRB or IEC before the investigators start any, um, any protocol procedures. They also ensure the annual review and, um, and then they make sure that, that the renewal occur. Um, just a little bit about the GCP guidelines. Uh, so GCP uh, is a good clinical practice. It is defined as the standard for designing, conducting, performing, uh, analyzing, and reporting of the clinical trials. Um, GCP is developed by the International Council of Harmonization as an international ethical scientific quality standard. Um, the GCP compliance provide um, all the participants and public's insurance that uh, their right safety and well-being uh, is in uh, that is involved in the clinical research are protected, and also the data which is collected it ha it is of high quality and it is reliable and uh, there is an integrity of data, and uh, this is basically a guidance. It's it provides the standard guidelines to conduct the clinical research. So, I mean, to conduct a clinical trial, there are a lot of challenges based on the based on the therapeutic indication. Um, so, and the complexity of the study, there are challenges, and that's why it says almost it takes almost decade to you know conduct a clinical trial and uh, have a drug approval. Um, in journal, I'm I'm just talking in journal. It's very high, hard to find sometimes the right patient that that exactly matches, um, you know, the, that fits the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And then on the top, there is um, the patient willingness to uh, voluntarily participation in the clinical trial and completing the study. Um, then there are different kinds of challenges of um, if the patient has a safety, um, you know, any kind of adverse events. So there are a lot of challenges itself. But um, I, I will be talking more about the challenges that are um, in the clinical trial industry during the COVID-19 time. Um, uh, so in March, uh, FDA, after the pandemic was, um, you know, it was, uh, it was mentioned that it's a, it's a pandemic, uh, COVID pandemic. So FDA provided some guidelines uh, to conduct the clinical trials. Um, and um, this is the this, these were the set of guidance that was for the industry investigate investigator and the institutional review boards um, because FDA recognized that there might be challenges that occur because of quarantine. Um, there were for a few months my sites were closed and uh, there was travel limitations and um, there will be uh, interruption in the supply chain of uh, investigational product and also you know the samples if it is collected there were vendor issues and um, and there could be issues that the you know the your participants the, the subject they can they, they become infected with covid-19 or the site personnel who is delegated might be affected uh, with the COVID. So FDA recognize all those um, challenges and uh, they recognize that the, maybe there will be a protocol modification that will be required or, um, you know, uh, and because of there might be some unavoidable deviations that occur due to the COVID-19. Um, so uh, in my company and especially for my sites, um, so uh, as per FDA guidelines and um, so they, there were the telemedicine solution and sites also had their own, um, you know, SOPs based on these FDA guidelines. So they, the PIs, they started conducting the study visits and they completed assessments over telemedicine platform. And also uh, for some of the patients, the healthcare professional, delegated professional from the site, 
um, for uh, for example, nurses they they uh, they went to patients' home actually um, for the assessments and withdrawing blood, and then also for the infusion. Uh, so that the you, the you know the clinical trial at least they can bare minimum conduct those assessment and uh, to avoid those um, uh, protocol deviations. Um, and and this is a slide that um, you know I wanted to show that I was uh, as a CRA usually I visit the site and uh, I look into the data but I was conducting all the virtual site selection visit uh, site initiation and monitoring visits um, so there was uh, our company created a secure portal um, via share file to upload the site that was only the delegated person can upload uh, source documents that the monitor can review um, based on so th that was pretty secure document and the, then the PI I have interviewed um, the investigator or the PIs via the video call and that's how I able to you know um, the, to comply all the clinical trial regulations without uh, any major protocol deviation. So uh, even it is virtual or on site, the key element of the execution was to take care of all the logistic that the IP is reached on the time. Uh, there is a quality compliance check. Uh, there is a proper communication, either it is at the, um, uh, as a video call or email or any kind of um, communication channel. And there was all, always transparency. Um, so um, come, just switching my gear. Uh, to the COVID-19. Um, so I was just reading this article, I glancing, I did not read this completely um, in the New York Times and where they were discussing, there was a discussion going on that how many years, as I mentioned, takes um, at minimum to, you know, to come up with any medication. For example, if you say rotavirus, it take on the average, it took 15 years to get that medication. And if we move with that speed, uh, the pandemic, uh, through the trial, they are expecting the, the vaccine, it might be approved by 2032 and 2033, but uh, we are going very optimistic here. The goal is to um, get the vaccine ready in 18 months. Um, so I'm still skeptical um, because based on the previous data that has been, uh, you know, based on our previous understanding how much time it takes um, to build any uh, drug or any vaccine. But um, there there could be, you know, if the, uh, because there is right, this is the right time when we have plenty of patients all over the globe, and then there are a lot of trials that are going on. And if the, the regulatory authorities have a accelerated or fast track review, the timelines can be cut short but um, I, I still, I'm not sure that how, uh, if it is possible to get the vaccine in 18 months, but yes, there is, a, there is a discussion if somebody wanted to read this article, I found it very interesting. Then I was also looking um, at the COVID-19 studies um, in, on the clinicaltrial.gov. And please uh, come, uh, take two, three minutes more, or two, three minutes okay. more. Yeah, yeah. So I'll be, I'll be just. This is my last one or two slides. So in the, I found that in the, in on the clinical trial portal, there are already thirty three thousand three hundred seventy studies registered for the COVID nineteen. And uh, looking in India, this is the recent publication uh, which provide the COVID nineteen related trials in India, and it says that um, there are three thirty one studies that were registered at CTRI, and um, out of 333, there are 203 trials um, that um, um, out of 203 trials, 125, which is 61% were a used trial and um, the other were the allopathic trials. So this is just the information that are the kind of studies that has been going globally as well as in India. And on my, because we have an office in India as well. So this is what uh, the information I found on our India corner in, uh, in our own company website that Ayush Ministry um, and the Council of um, Scientific and Industrial Research, they are working together to on validating four Ayush formulation against COVID-19. Um, and uh, with that, um, I'm sorry, I took a little longer. Um, I just don't want to rush to the information, but um, thank you. I 
I just wanted to give an overview, uh, but uh, I think for the Indian scenario, for the Indian regulatory about the latest COVID-19 update, um, I think, oh, I wanted to move it, give it to Dr. Mehdi, and who is going to provide a little bit more information and even educate me. I do not know much about, uh, you know, um, the status of COVID-19 vaccine development in India. So over to you, Dr. Mehdi. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll just upload my slide. Yes, sir. Please share your uh, slides. Slide. It's process. Yes, we can see it. Yeah. I'm not able to full scale this slide. Anyway, uh, thank you, Dr. Monica. And it was a very nice presentation in overall um, clinical trial. Uh, for a participant, I just want to make a couple of points. Uh, like normally when you say uh, clinical trial, there are different you know, uh, terminology it is used. So we say that the uh, gold standard for clinical trial, you call it RCTs, randomized control clinical trial. But there are, uh, as I say, that initially you need to also uh, distinguish what is in a clinical trial, what is, uh, you call it clinical research. Because in Indian regulation, earlier clinical research was not regulated, but with this new drug rule, uh, it has been regulated since uh, 19 September, 2019. So as you know that in India, our base of the clinical trial regulation is drug and cosmetic drug. And uh, main uh, the schedule we regulated by schedule Y. Now, since uh, that uh, practical implication of new drug clinical trial rule 19 March 2019 and also been incorporated biomedical research for new requirement. So it has been implemented since last year. Now, this is what the Drug and Cosmetic Act uh, 1940 and 1945. That means the Drug and Cosmetic Act was constituted in 1940, that is pre-independence and the rule is implemented in 1945. This is related to World War II. I'll just briefly say the history, how a regulation came to India. When Indian uh, army were fighting under the British troop in Burma, there are a lot of Indian army, they died, not because of a you know, bullet or uh, bomb blast, it is because of malaria. And that time, one of the UK company, they were supplying the medicine, Quinin. So after giving Quinin, still people are dying. So they had an, you know, uh, apprehension why if uh, is there any problem with the medicine and that is why they file a court you now PIL in Bombay High Court that time and they constitute a Hathi committee who recommend that India should have a regulation uh, and that is why with the Hathi committee recommendation we have a drug and cosmetic act 1940 that is pre-independence and rule 1945 then we have the you know Chopra committee then we have muscle car committee recently 2013, we had a lot of irregularities in uh, part of somewhere in Madhya Pradesh, and Supreme Court had constituted a committee, uh, Ranjit Roy Choudhury Committee and Kokete Committee. I was also part of that committee. So that is why we refer it to Drug and Cosmetic Act 1945. Now, for participants, I wanted to make it that we always say new drug. How do you say new drug? It is with the uh, legal provision 122U. E, that means if a regulatory authority approve a drug, then you call it new drug till four years. Or if you change, uh, you know, indication or doses form or route of administration, it is automatically become a new drug. Or if you mix, we have in India, we have a lot of fixed dose combination. You might have seen in a the newspaper, there are 345 drugs has been banned in the last two years. So if you make fixed dose combination by one or two drugs, it is automatically being, become new. Now, FDC is promoted, like if we use for tuberculosis, if we use for malaria or HIV, or even hypertension. But otherwise, that FDC which has been used antimicrobial or some other where it is not rationalized, then it is cannot be used. Now for vaccine, please remember, vaccine is always a new drug till it is in your market. So you cannot call it an old drug after four years. Vaccine is always a new. So once the four years is completed, then it is become an old drug. That means till the four years in India, every six monthly we collect the information till two years. Then yearly till 
40 years. You might remember that when you go to pharmacy, when you buy a drug, there is a piece of paper that is we call a package insert. This is called periodic safety update report. So continuously these products are monitored. This is what our base earlier before new drug rule came, schedule Y, which talk about requirement of pre-clinical toxicity study, we call it non-clinical toxicity study, or any clinical, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. So these are the requirement as per the schedule Y. Now, whole schedule Y has been replaced with new drug clinical trial rule. So these are Cillian figures that it talk about all the requirement, including the GCP, good clinical practice, Indian GCP, and also ICMR guideline for biomedical research. So these are the part that schedule Y talked about that when you make an application, what are the data is required? Like with appendix one till appendix 12, which <laughs> talk about compensation, because this is a new area, nowhere in a globe, it talk about compensation in case of a SAE or research related injury. This is started in India in 2013 onward. So other places it was not there. So this is a one example that India started the compensation for uh, you know SAE related to clinical trial and also research related injury. So in case of SA, we call it in case of a death or there is a hospitalization if the person is in OPD or there is a significant medical disability or there is a teratogenicity, then we call it SA. That means in case of SA in clinical trial, we have to report within 24 hours. That is mandatory in India. So we have a provision that we have a subject expert committee of all 25, like you say, cardiology, pulmonology, like the 25 committees are there. So whenever they make an application, it is everything is online. And now like USFDA, they have to deal with the application within 30 days. So after that, that it goes to the committee within 30 days and they give an approval. One more provision in India, where we started in 2016, that for academic institute, because of compensation, because compensation, it is minimum is eight lakh, till 73.4 lakhs rupees. If there is a healthy volunteer diet in BAB study, bioavailability, bioequivalent study, or phase one study, we have to give compensation up to 73.4 lakhs. So we started a new provision of academic clinical trial. So in this academic clinical trial, like our PGs, they do the studies. So we do not have a provision to give compensation. So this was started in 2016. I was uh, the initially, I started this initiation. Then we submitted to Dr. Rajit Roy where it was parliamentary committee, it was decided, then Gazette notification was notified. So here it is says that you can do clinical trial. There is no permission is required from regulatory authority like CDSU, Central Drug Standard Control Organization, and for the academic purpose. So this data cannot be used for any commercial purpose. So for all the academic institute, they can initiate uh, this clinical trial as an academic clinical trial. So this is do not need, only you have to go to ethics committee. You take an approval from ethics committee. Ethics committee will communicate to regulatory authority. So this is what the provision is that you need not have to go to regulatory authority. Ethics committee will com you know, communicate with regulatory authority and you can do academic clinical trial. So this is what for PGI, like I have a user ID and password for PGI. So anybody want any import or approval, so you can go to the SUGAM portal. So this is a SUGAM portal. Like I have got permission for importing the license from Brazil or France. So you can get it here sitting in a PGI, you can get an approval. So this is what the, all the licenses we can avail from the regulatory authority by sitting in PGI itself. So this, the method how you apply, how do you get an approval? We have published in Indian Journal of Pharmacology, experience of academic institute for importing novel preclinical drug into India. So you can go through and get an idea, how do you apply for it? Now coming to another section, what I said is clinical research. Whatever earlier I say, that is a regulatory clinical trial. Like you say, you do want to do a phase zero study, phase one study, phase two, three, four, these are regulatory. But other than you wanted to do a thesis, a clinical research, so there is a biomedical research that is under DHR, Department of Health Research. So here, one that earlier, you call it ICMR guideline, or you call it GCP guideline. So I wanted to make you point, understand, when you say guideline, it is you may follow or you may not follow. 
But when you apply to DCJ office, Drug Controller General of India, they say NOC is given provided you follow ICMR guideline or GCP guideline. So it becomes automatically mandatory that you have to follow or they will say you register in CTRI, Clinical Trial Registry of India. So it becomes mandatory. Now, GCP, though it is a guideline, it is attached earlier attached to schedule Y. So it is mandatory. If you do not follow GCP, then it trial can be stopped because it is attached to schedule Y, which is a law. So now this new drug rule where it replaced schedule Y, now it is mandatory that we have to follow ICMR guideline. So they have created that when it was launched in 19 March, they say chapter four will be activated after 180 days. And this 180 days came on 19 September. So 12 September, they have issued this letter because there is a separate ethics committee that need to be registered in DHR, Department of Health Research. So from 19 September, this is started, that registering ethics committee, which is not related to regulatory trial, like we have a in PJ intramural ethics committee that need to be registered in DHR. Then only they have a power to give an approval for this kind of clinical research. So this is about the biomedical and health research. I'll not go in detail. So what you can do is all the participants, you can go to ICMR Biotics Unit that is in Bangalore, NCDIR. So in that, you will get all the information, all the, you can download all the, that how we have a common ethics committee form that can be implemented throughout the India. There is also concept like Dr. Monica said that in US there is a central ethics committee. We have also central ethics committee or we have earlier started with uh, uh, ethics committee, central ethics committee for COVID-19 also. So we have a central ethics committee under ICMR, but we also coming up with another concept is DAC. DAC is designated ethics committee because when you plan for a multicentric trial, it may not be feasible to go to each and every ethics committee. It takes time. So India is coming up with a concept of that is also. So we can download all the information from the ICMR Biotics Committee unit that is from the Bangalore NCDR. So this is what uh, it has been notified that chapter four, that it will be activated after 180 days and it was activated in September. Now, Dr. Monica had already said that we have completed 10 years of clinical trial registration of India. This is nothing but a transparency. If you wanted to do it, you wanted to see that you wanted to do a clinical trial, how many clinical trials are going on? So we have a registry in China, we have a registry in Europe, India, CTRI, or the major registry is clinical trial .com. Now, if you see number of clinical trials, this is for a transparency, accountability. Now, the change is that we started in uh, uh, 2009 and India has already completed 10 years. Now you can see a report of 10 years report in Indian Journal of Pharmacology, this issue about CTRI. Now what they have decided that earlier anything you do, whether it's prospective, retrospective, even you started uh, later, you can register. But now they say that you can only register in CTRI prospectively. So they are not going to accept it. This is a change has been taken place. And this CTRI or clinical trial dot com number is important. Those who are a student, you want to do a thesis. And if you wanted to publish this article, then you do need that number. Otherwise, editor will not accept it. Now, if you see our data, 2012, we had 2,539. Then in 2015, initially 2005 to 2010 and 12, there is a huge number of trials in India. There are 10,000 clinical trials, but because of compensation issue in 2013, trial were you know, uh, reducing the number, even a global clinical trial in 2016, 17, 18, maybe around 53. But this number, if you see 2016, it was reduced to 23 because of compensation. People thought that whenever they go for a clinical trial, that they have to give a lot of compensation. So trial were diverted to Malaysia, Australia, even to Pakistan. So. Uh, like you take an example right now, that number of clinical trial in COVID-19. So if you look at the clinical trial in July uh, till 21st July, there are 2,684, CTRI 322, Chinese 682, and European 277, Australia 88. There is a huge number of trial. And during till July, if you see 
how many drug has been repurposed. Like you say, in, you take an example of India, we repurpose hydroxychloroquine, we repurpose chloroquine, ivermectin, there are similar biologics or antiviral. There are a huge number of 108 drugs, even anti protozoal drugs. So these all have been approved by regulatory authority as an investigational. You take an example of plasma therapy is also, it is an investigational. Okay, so there are a huge number of you know, drugs, including vaccine has been going on. Now I'll talk about a recent development related to clinical trial rule in India. So this was done in 19 March, 2019, it was started. But if you look at the Gazette notification, it was started in 2018. This should have been come in 2018 because of court case, it was you know, implemented from 19 March, 2019. And they say this chapter four will be implemented after 180 days. That is what biomedical research has been implemented since 19 September, 2019. Now this regulation, you know, clearly say what you mean by clinical trial, clinical, pharmacological, including dynamic, kinetic, adverse event. So this has been very clear. Now, earlier there are a lot of queries regarding IUS product, botanical product, phytopharmaceuticals, or herbal product. A lot of people get confused. Where I have to go? Do I have to go to DCJ office? Do I have to go to IUS ministry? Now it has been very clear that when you, earlier used to say that if you claim with any herbal product, Come to this is a office because then you have to say that which ingredient is working pharmacologically now if you see pharmaceuticals that you have to uh, now phytopharmaceuticals uh, you know pharmaceuticals you have to say this active food ingredient, uh, uh, ingredient is active so you have to identify that before you make an application so here new drug clinical rules 2019 say it include 13 chapters 107 rules eight schedule there are 28 form because earlier when you make an application like in USFD 1527 in India, we used to use form 44. So here typical definition was clearly said about academic clinical trial, bio study, BAB studies, or biomedical health research. This was not there. Biomedical health research was not there. Then we are also going to, you know, release the GCP guideline and for the global clinical trial also. So these are the definitions. But we need to know that I have already talked about new drug Dr. Monica already talked about investigational new drug, or how do you say new chemical entity? Then orphan drug, it is very important because we get a lot of waiver for the orphan drug. And how do you explain phytopharmaceutical? I say, we explain if you identify four active pharmaceutical ingredients. And how do you say placebo? Earlier we don't have, if you do a clinical trial, somebody is sponsored is from coming from US, you do study, then they go back. Now, if the person is getting benefit, we do not have a medicine because it has not been marketed. Now it is clearly defined the post-trial access. If the person getting benefit, you have to make it available. So this has been clearly defined, post-trial access. So these are the chapters. I will not go in detail because of time interest. So these are uh, chapters. But I have already said we have a provision of academic clinical trial. What I said, if you're looking for a new indication, drug is already approved, new doses form, and also new formulation. So there you can make it as an academic clinical trial. These are different form 21 to 28. So here I wanted to make it a point, how do you get new provision for post-trial access? So if you do a clinical trial sponsored from outside, and if the person is getting, getting benefit, that PI will say agree into availability of post-trial access. But here it is uh, such that, that in case of you are giving a medicine, because you only know safety efficacy. Like suppose I wanted to use a drug for six months. That means I have to do a long-term toxicity study of the animal, which otherwise you cannot, you know, indicate it for more than six months. So if the patient has any problem, it is, uh, they will not blame to the sponsor because sponsor will be not responsible for giving the compensation. So that is what in agreement, they will make an availability for post trial access. So these are the forms are there. Uh, city form, I'll not go in detail of Indian regulation. But here, any new drug application for IND, please be remember, in India, we only allow that phase one clinical trial if the drug is discovered in India. Otherwise, we do not allow to make an application in India. So what they have to do is they have to do an early phase outside India, then they'll make an application. So this is what 
that you need all as per that new drug rule or schedule were earlier, all this acute toxicity study, then subchronic toxicity study, long-term toxicity study, they have to make an application. Now, like in case of a vaccine or biosimilar, they have to go to D DBT, that is RCGM, then they have to get an approval, then only they can make an application to DCJ office. So these are second part of the schedule. So any data generated by application that all the information has to be there and they have to put it in uh, Sugom portal. And once it is there, there is now timeline like US, if you make a phase one application, we do not get any reply within 30 days. That means it's a good news. Then you can go for it doing a studies. Similarly, India also started that if you make an application, if you do not get any reply, that means a good news that it has been approved. So that's how we go, that we have an IND committee, we have a subject expert committee, we have a technical committee, and we have an apex committee as per Supreme Court guidance. But here it is very important that those who do a phase one study or any evaluation in human, you please remember that drug has to be prepared in GMP condition. That has to be prepared in GMP condition. So when you make an application, you have to also make an application for test licenses. And then only you are getting an approval for doing the studies. So these are the approval process. As I say, the time is limited here for new drug application. They're given 30 days time. Within 30 days, they get an approval in the Indian regulation also. For ethics committee, they have to go for a, uh, 45 days. So. Now the new provision said about some of the provision, waiver of clinical trial. Like suppose if you're working for malaria, if you're working for you know drug resistant tuberculosis or any orphan drug, you can make an approval. Suppose earlier drug is marketed in the US and Europe, it is for there for long years. So when they wanted to come to India, India say you do a bridging trial. So that means they will allow to do a bridging trial, keeping one center in south or north or east because we wanted to also know that how the drug is going to behave pharmacogenomically. So now it has been waived. Suppose if you have an Indian data, like suppose you do a study in US and you say that we have included a South Asian population or Indian population, then we look at a subgroup population, how drug is, it is behaving. So based on that, we can give an approval. So this is what the waiver is there, even for safety pharmacology study or animal toxicity study also, that we are proudly say that India is a member of OECD. We have more than 55 centers. But if somebody done a preclinical toxicity study outside under OECD principle, then data is accepted in India also. So this is new thing that we have for clinical trial so that we have a fast track policy that we can approve the drug for the needy people. Now, another thing is that we also make it mandatory in case of a new drug coming to India and we get an approval based on the data generated in the US and Europe and other rest of the ICH countries, then we'll make sure that phase four post-marketing trial they have to do, subject to post-marketing trial. So there is a difference of post-mark phase four study and post-marketing surveillance, PMS studies. That need to be understood and what is an PSU, I already have been discussed. So coming to ethics committee that Earlier in India, we had a lot of ethics committee. People used to say we have independent ethics committee, institute ethics committee. Now 2013 onward, it has been recommended to all the ethics committee should register in DCJ office. So in the, once they register, there is a particular criteria. Like normally in ethics committee, we keep the standard because India wanted to make it that all should be accredited. Ethics committee, the PI, clinical trial site, it should be accredited. So ethics committee, it has 10 standard and 49 elements. So if you maintain the 10 standard and 49 elements, that means you can go for a registration in DCJ office and we have one more accreditation process is NABH. So those registered ethics committee, they have only power to give an approval for clinical trial, otherwise no. And those who do a biomedical research, a clinical research, they have to register in DHR, Department of Health Research. So they can only give an approval. So this is the new thing changes is that as per our ethics committee, as per ICMR guideline and GCP guideline, that we have you know uh, 12 to 15 members. Now you say the registration earlier it was for three years. Now it is for five years. Earlier that recommendation right now the new recommendation that 50% of our ethics committee should be from outside the institute. 
chairman of the ethics committee it should be outside the institute because you want to make it a you know independent ethics committee that means a director dean or principal of the institute cannot become a, an ethics committee chairman so that is why the new the, uh, the earlier recommendation also there 50 percent from outside at least one, one woman member should be there there is a legal person there's a social scientist so this is a justification because whenever you discuss a protocol if that you know uh, lay person understand that, that means the participant can understand the protocol. The legal person, why they have included legal person? Because in ethics committee that you also discuss about agreement with the sponsor, the legal document. That is why the legal, and India we have a provision, even the legal person should be practicing lawyer. Otherwise they are not eligible to become a member of ethics committee. So these are so many changes in ethics committee now. It has been registered when it was in 2013. There are 1,200 ethics committee. Then there's a re-registration. There are 850 ethics committee. So these are all been regulated by DCJ office and NFH. Now, India, the CDSU, they have a provision for making an application. You could happen to go to like uh, Maryland, US FDA. So you can go and discuss with the US FDA. Similarly, same provision has been kept for Indian regulation also, you make an application that you can discuss with the public relation office of DCJ office. Now that you know the money of for making an application is also huge for IND, they used to take in five lakhs rupees, earlier it was 50,000, but you can clear all the point. And also you can see that what the data will be required so that it will not delay the application. So that is has been done. Now, whatever what I said is everything it is based on national health policy of India 2017. Because you say a product is in the market. So as a regulator, it is a responsibility. This product should be safe as well as efficacious also. So everything has been done in order to have an accreditation process that whatever we do, we generate a data which is at global standard. So based on the data, the regulator can approve the product into the market. So this is what that we talked about a regulation with the humanity. So all the regulation do is a stringent, but it is also friendly to the stakeholders like pharmaceutical company, CRO, these are friendly. And now it is some of the regulation become mandated. So this is my lab. You can go to the website of EPL. Thank you very much. So if you have any questions, we can discuss. Thank you, sir. For, uh, thank you, Dr. Monica and uh, Dr. Mehdi for so wonderful and informing uh, talk. So uh, the presentation is open for questions. If anyone has, please ask it. Uh, good evening, sir. I have a question. Uh, yeah. If I have a data which has been collected before, uh, I'm working on that data and my CTRI is not there. So would I not be able to publish my data now because the CTRI is not there with me? I don't have that approval from the CTR yeah, and I can't do it now. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Now, uh, what I said is earlier, CTR used to take even if you completed they register now, they have said that they have already completed 10 years. So they only go for a perspective. Many of the major journal, when they want to publish, they want this CTRI number or clinical doc number. And share the slide. Uh, I'm not able to do it. Can you do it, you sir? Let me try. The downside of the screen. In my computer, it is not coming. Carry on, please carry on. Or stop uh, on the top, it's somewhere it says stop sharing. Yeah, so it's it's yeah, yeah. unshared. So what uh, I'm telling you that uh, this is uh, because many of the major journals, they want uh, uh, this publication, this uh, CTRI number or clinical trial numbers, uh, as we have an association for editors. So in that association, that there is an agreement that unless you have a publication number, they're not going to you know, accept this paper. But many other journals, they publish it. So it's better to register in CTRI or clinicaltrial.com. So, but the data is already been collected before, so can I be... I can still register in CTRI then? You can put the request. You can put the request to CTRI. 
Okay, fine. Uh, if anyone is not asking, uh, my first question is uh, to Dr. Vinish. So my question is in uh, the uh, phase three trials, when you are doing uh, in thousand to three thousand of individuals, so these are heterogeneous, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so they have an ethnicity difference also, or this is a mixture of. Ethnicity? It's a mixture. So um, here in United States, we make sure that you know we include all the ethnicity, like from um, Spanish population to mostly um, Caucasians, Asians. So we have a different good combination. So we, we see the wider range of safety signals and effectiveness in each um, ethnic population. So we make sure that we only not include um, the African Americans or only the Caucasians. So we, we make sure that there is a, that it should be a mixture. So what would be the sample size per ethnicity? Um, it, 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 it depends on the study population. It depends upon the clinical indication and the actual, you know, for like for the rare disease where you won't get that many patients. Um, so it depends. Basically, when we have this protocol, who designed this protocol, so we have a statistical data management team who decide like uh, the cutoff number and then the sample size. So I cannot say it like, you know, randomly, but it is based, it really studies to studies. An indication to indication. Uh, I, can I add that uh, to the question? So now yes, when you do the studies, like you are referring to phase three studies, so phase three A and phase three B, homogeneous and heterogeneous population. So all the sample size, it depends that suppose you wanted to uh, work on diabetes. You know that diabetes is uh, much more prevalent. So sample size will be different. Now, if you want to work on very orphan disease or very rare disease, then sample size. So it's depend on existing, what is the prevalence and incidence of the particular disease. So that way you have to calculate it. Thank you, sir. So my next question is to Dr. Mehdi. So my first question is to you, uh, is that in the phase four trials where uh, before the pre-marketing trials. So in that, uh, how many, uh, how many uh, study subjects are included? For the pre so, so this is how you calculated that uh, during the control clinical trial, what is the adverse event? So that way we can say that it's common, rare. So that way you have to uh, calculate. It's a huge number of, you know, uh, you want to go into, going to do that because we want to see that uh, we call it, uh, uh, what is the situation in the real life? In PMS or Facebook, we said, hey, what is the behavior of the drug in the real life? So. Uh, depending on the ADR being reported during the control clinical trial, we calculate that how many population you have to go for exposure. So it is a huge number. So uh, when you approve, there is a one is what I said that uh, it is a distinguished difference between phase four and PMS studies. So normally when you approve the product, what we say that that product is approved, then we are going to collect it. Uh, there is a marketing authorized folder is implemented by the company. So what they do is they exactly know that how many product has been sold. Okay, so they collect the information. So every six monthly, they have to submit to DCGA office. Okay, so that is you call periodic safety update report. And then yearly till four years. So in India, we call it till four years, but licensing authority, DCGA can ask the data at any time. So that is all. So if somebody asks you a question, how do you get to know that most updated information about the drug, you say, you just take out a small piece of paper that is all called PSU, uh, that, uh, uh, product leaflet. Okay, so you get an information. So all the PSUR data is updated in that product label. Thank you, sir. So uh, when are, uh, sorry. Uh, ma'am, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, good evening, ma'am. Good evening, sirs. Uh, I want to ask that uh, is there any particular protocol or particular procedure um, to uh, approve uh, any other intervention like uh, exercise uh, or uh, yoga that uh, um, because for uh, a different kind of population there are different protocols for uh, like diabetes there is a, a different protocol for pregnancy there is a different protocol is there any procedure uh, to approve these uh, particular protocols or invention uh, interventions or not See, when you talk to, uh, regarding the protocol to USFDA, they usually, because I used to go with USFDA, so they call it protocol and science. So what do you say, the protocol, you have written the protocol, which is all the validated, you know, methodology is there, and which has been approved. So if there is an amendment, there is an amendment. I'll tell you that there is an issue took place where uh, 
there is a standard drug therapy with yoga and people uh, person had gone for an exercise he fell down made an fracture so it came to compensation committee okay so uh, these are the issue need to be addressed so that is why the protocol we say that protocol is validated the methodology is validated what you do that uh, then you put in references and protocol is uh, approved in a particular form that how many amended everything has been notified to the ethics committee and to the regulatory authority also Oh, okay, sir. Thank you. Any other Anyone questions? else for questions? I think there is uh, no more questions. So I thank you, Dr. Monika Minesh and Dr. Vikas Medhi for joining us today and giving enlightening us about this uh, important topic of clinical trials, which is uh, now and then coming into the news for COVID-19 vaccine. So most of the common people will be very much enlightened to hear this talk and know what is exactly happening. So uh, thank you again. And uh, I'll also announce that uh, the under the biology series, the next talk is tomorrow. For It will be by Prashant Verma on Pranayam in Yoga Scripture. So please do join us. And thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eksai, Dr. Manika.